Lafferty, and welcome to the Drinks on Monday podcast. Dan is sitting this week out, uh, and Pat and I, Pat Sullivan and I, are joined with Carolyn. Around here, magazines, uh, Southwest suburb bartender of 2014, was it? Yeah. Award winning bartender uh, and shit talker who I work with at the restaurant that I work at. Pleasure's all yours. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the 1991 classic black exploitation film, New Jack City, and um, the Catch Me Outside, How About That Girl, who I just found out who she was a couple weeks ago. Your daughter? <laughs> Legitimate. From one of those f- Florida trips from your 20s with Matt Keisha and Dan Lynch. <sighs> I, I'm just going to pin it on Matt Keisha. <laughs> He's got another one floating around. <laughs> Super sperm, man. All you had to do was look at a girl and get her pregnant. Uh, so what's going on, guys? How, how was our week? I saw Get Out last night. Ah, what would you think? Um, I, I, so I was in the theater and I realized... Did you see it yet? Uh, no. Okay. I just realized that it was a video about uh, racism. Eh, yeah, definitely. But I, I had, I know Mike saw it. You saw the critic screening before it was released. Yes, right? it did. Yeah. yeah, no, I didn't. I saw it in Gen Pop <laughs> Monday afternoon, a week and a half into its release. So I had a very different theater going experience than Mike Vanderbilt. And I realized that about halfway through when the theater wasn't quite full yet, but the people still sat next to me and started taking pictures of themselves. Um, the lady in front of me had really big hair and didn't recline her seat. So I did miss a portion of the film. Because I legitimately could not see over. But thankfully, she brought in Sbarro's, so I got to smell that the entire time. But uh, other than that, it was a pretty fucking good movie. Where would you go, Crestwood? No, I went to Chicago Ridge. I did a double feature at Chicago Ridge. And oh, she, she brought the Sbarro right yeah, into right, the mall. Right, right, yeah, right around the corner. Okay. Um, in true Mike Vanderbilt fashion, I uh, had no one to go to the movies with, so I went to a double feature <laughs> by myself. I saw Get Out and then piggybacked right into Logan. Oh, I love it. That, hey, you know what? Fuck I, it. I'm going to do it from who, now on. Who yeah. are you going to talk to at the movies? Exactly. Who gives a shit? You know, and it's really only. Who did it, of course, I'm guessing the people in front of you probably talked to each other. Oh, everybody was hey, get out. I was the only person not being talked to or photographed in the middle of that movie. Um, the dude next to me, though, like I didn't say shit because I'm not one of those people that like fuck it. Like it's a fucking movie, man. Like whatever. If I was at home, I'd be playing on my cell phone. Why well, am I going to shit at her for playing on her cell phone in the theater? But uh, he told her to fucking knock it off because he was getting real into it. Like he was, yeah. Was he there with her? Yeah, they were on a date or something. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but me, me and him had a bonding moment because uh, when, when the, the the second day into the guy's trip and get out, when yeah. all the other crusty white people start showing up, there's a scene where he meets this couple and the wife grabs his arm and the husband's in a wheelchair and he gives this look like, yeah, you look really good fucking my wife, and it's like a split second shot, but it conveys a lot of information. And I started giggling, and he started giggling, and we realized that we were both fucking Did you guys high five two perverts sitting next to each other that got it like the sex slaves. <laughs> they really are. Um, but well, get out! I gotta say, it's totally worth the hype. Totally one hundred percent. I agree with Mike. You know, it's not a perfect movie. Um, a couple missteps. I, I but I mean, the missteps. I mean, if there are any missteps, it's like it's it. They're so small. It's just good trash. Right. But it, uh, overall. Great movie. I think the TSA dude was played out a little much. Uh, let me let's talk about that for just a okay. hot minute because, yes, you, there's a the movie is very. I think it very uh, definitely blends the comedy and the uh, and the scares. Yeah, uh, there's really not a wasted frame of film oh, in the it. The scares were the the way they built tension in that thing was fucking phenomenal. And um, the ending isn't drawn out at all. The ending kind of moves by at a click. Sometimes you even if you're enjoying a movie, you're like, well, come on, let's just wrap it up, guys. Like. Uh, any villain that he has to take on, he uh, the hero kind of uh, takes him out pretty quickly. It was one of those things where they were wrapping it up, and it was it took me a minute to realize they were wrapping it up because I wanted to see the story kind of play out more. Even I would have once once they got to the reveal of the premise, I was I could have sat there for another half hour, but then you find out no, there's only really another fifteen minutes left. Um, but yeah, I was I was invested in like, I guess the mythology or whatever like you know what i mean like the universe yeah um i wish there was more of the guy in the black mask though because he's on all the posters and you see him in the beginning yeah which obviously it's the brother they never yeah. like, clearly clarify i always that. i figured it was brother because it was in his car yeah but like he's on the poster and you kind of you're kind of but i it sounds like there was a lot that was cut from the movie but i was long enough already it's almost two hours it's close yeah, yeah. It, it needed it was a good length why not cut out another 10 minutes yeah but the 
the TSA character, which sometimes it can be, it, the humor is almost, it, his parts particularly play out like a Key and peel sketch. Right. But if you were in that situation as uh, the hero, wouldn't you have a friend that would be kind of acting like the TSA guy who would be taking everything with a bit of a sense of humor? I don't know. Like, I pictured, like, if I, I hope was I him. I have friends like, that good that would come get me, or otherwise like, I think. <laughs> like, in my, in my, in my, the way I'm putting myself in the character, like, you'd be the TSA guy, and you'd be cracking up laughing about sex slaves the whole time. Right. And, and if, that's because that's who you are as a person. And if you went missing, I would come get you. If I went missing, I don't know if anyone would come get me. We would just assume that you were ditching <laughs> exactly. all of us. That's it. If I disappeared for, like, a week, people would be like, oh, well, Pat's just not picking up his phone. He must have got drunk and lost it again. Yeah. You know? Kind of reminds me of Mike when he never answers his phone. Well, that's what I was getting at indirectly. <laughs> Why do you need to call me? You can text me. Like I texted him before this podcast to make sure he was home and he didn't get a response. I was having. A you nap. can't get upset about that. But I, I was, was having a nap. Of course, I was just trying to cash you outside. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's Carolyn. What do you got going on with? What did you show? do this weekend? Oh, nothing. Now, Carolyn, Carolyn tends bar. Hi. Carolyn uh, checks bags. Carolyn. Uh, They've been kind of small lately. Uh, check bags means to make money. More like a, a Kyle kitty purse kind of money bag. So what did you do this week? Do you have any good stories? Uh, let's see. Well, you know, it's only Tuesday, so just barely started the week, Mike. I'm just asking. Well, did anything happen to you last week? How was your weekend? It was all right. I worked at Chili's. You know, typical bar weekend. Five people call off, you get the job done. <laughs> you no. got to bleep that out. Which just says the name of the place. No, we, we've never said the name of the place. No, yes, we have. Oh, we've we let, have? We've let it slip. Okay. We've let it slip all the time. Well, you know particularly, you cash me. Partic- <laughs> particular in the third hour of the show is usually when uh, everybody gets a little the loose. The thing comes out. Well, there. You know where to find me. So Carolyn's drinking some cheap wine out of the box. Pat and I have some Revolution Fist City, which is a Chicago pale ale. And now this is... Uh, Pat brought an interesting thing. It's called Stillhouse Original Moonshine, and it uh, it comes in a gas can. Yeah. Looks like the stuff, like, for Zippo lighters. It doesn't taste horrible. I'm very big on packaging. I, I went to Kenwood uh, tonight, as I normally do on a Tuesday night, with uh, very little expert. I, I was going to go in and just kind of get domestic beer. I was going to get Bud Light and a fucking bottle of Jameson. And I was like, well, let's not do, let's not do that. Let's see what else we can come up with. So Revolution uh, Brewery. <clears throat> we had our, they're the only kind of beer that we serve at my hotel is Revolution. They're the only beer we have on tap. We have a partnership with them. We had our Christmas party or holiday party, non denominational holiday party, at their uh, tap room, like brewery on Belmont and Kedzie, which you if you've ever watched a TV show or movie shot in Chicago, you've seen the place because it's used in everything. But um, I'm when I drink at work, I drink their beer and. Uh, I like it, and they're from Chicago, and uh, they're good people. They're really fucking cool people. So I figured we'd give that a plug. Now, the whiskey, <laughs> I almost got the Georgia corn syrup moonshine That comes shit in the mason, that's in the jar. mason jar. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, like, I, I'm very susceptible to, like, gimmicky packaging. So when I saw whiskey that came in a gas can, I was like, well, I have to give that. Oh, original moonshine. Yeah, Great. and they had different flavors, too. They had, like, mint. And they had uh, fi- some fireball oh. knockoff. It's not horrible. It's rough. I don't know. Just, you'll, it'll go. It's like Everclear light. It, it, it really does. It does smells like Everclear. You want to taste? No, no. That's okay. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> quite all right with that. I'm I, fine. I prefer to stay alive. It kind of reminds me of like if I'm going to polish something. <laughs> you know, like if I want to stain the porch or something. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure you got this at Kenwood and not at a Home Depot? Uh, were you drinking before you bought it, Pat? No, I was completely sober. <laughs> yeah, completely it's kind of gross, but we're going to get through we'll it. Give it a good home. Yeah. So, I don't know anything else. You, um, got, you guys have drank far worse. Let me think. That remember I mean, we drank ever. I mean, I've drank Everclear. That might be the worst thing no. that I've ever drank. Remember when you mixed all that alcohol? That wasn't that bad, though. It was all sugar. I that was where the, the Blue Island iced tea Oh, yeah. It was all sugar. It wasn't bad. It just didn't get you. It was too much sugar and not enough alcohol. Yeah. Because yeah. you got a headache before you was, got drunk. Yeah, it was hardly the worst. I think the worst thing I've ever drank has to be Everclear. Everclear is, I mean, it's it's great alcohol. It's not meant to be drunk. Drunk. Um, drunk drank on its own. It's, it's not. No. Um, what did I do? I, uh. You were a 
Brubaker's last night. I was at Brubaker's last night. I love when I get up at 5 in the morning for work and I go on Facebook and I see that Mike Vanderbilt posted 45 minutes ago. And you know it's because he's just fucking I had loaded to, still up. I had, to, I had the thirst last night. Sir, server life. I had the thirst. It happens sometimes. I stopped at the Grove. <clears throat> I saw that too. What the fuck? We, um, uh, it was Tiffany's birthday. Uh, Mason? Yeah, okay. from Juliet. Uh, so we decided uh, she came up. We went out for drinks. Uh, we went to the Grove. You're just hoping to catch me there with my side hose. I was hoping. <laughs> <laughs> that's, where, that's, where, that's where you bring the side hose. <laughs> I know. It's all right. Continue. And then um, uh, we went to Baracos. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we went to Brewmakers. That's literally the same exact information I got from Facebook at 5 o'clock this morning. <laughs> I was hoping you could, like, ex- expand on something. There really was not no. much. I drank. Um, I came back here. I passed out. I uh, I wasn't necessarily sick today, but I definitely was. I didn't do anything. I did not get up because I didn't have to. Yeah. I watched uh, Shock Treatment. The little known sequel to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah. Uh, doing research for an upcoming uh, Revenge of the Pod people. Um, we're doing this thing uh, for this episode this week where we have uh, a male film critic and a female film critic are, uh, have two films duke it out. I don't think it's ever been done before. <laughs> but And yours, yours is Shock Treatment. Shock Treatment versus Rocky Horror. Oh. And she does Rocky Horror? Yeah. Okay. I said I've, I figured I'd take the uh, the yeah, harder you'll fight. Take the underdog. Yeah. yeah, the underdog. I mean, I like shock treatment a lot. I mean, I can't. I don't dislike Rocky Horror, but I could fight. I could find a good fight for shock treatment. Where being a better you, movie. Where can you find shock treatment? Um, there's. Is it streaming anywhere? It's streaming on YouTube. Really? I have a. I, but I think it's a bootleg yeah. copy. I have it on. I bought it for six bucks on DVD, on Amazon. Um, yeah, I don't think it is streaming anywhere. Okay, and then I hosted the uh, the started hosting the new Daily Grindhouse podcast last week. We talked about snake exploitation movies. I, I haven't listened to it yet, but I saw the uh, um, the Venom seems to be the favorite amongst fans. Have you ever seen Venom? No, but that S so, yeah. is it's... that Corman? No, it just feels like Corman. But it's AIP, I think. Yeah, it's. But I don't know if he was an, after he sold it. I don't think he. Per, I don't think he had a hand in it. Okay. It would probably have a little bit more cachet if he actually had a hand in it. Yeah. No, Venom is from '81, and it's it's just absolutely bonkers. It's Dog Day Afternoon meets Rattlers. So Klaus Kinski and Oliver Reed and Susan George from Enter the Ninja are going to kidnap this rich English kid, but. Uh, he picks up a snake from the pet store, and like they got the wrong shipment. So instead of a, <laughs> instead of just like an African house snake, fucking sold already. <laughs> he gets a fucking black mamba, the deadliest snake in the world. Yeah, and he brings it home. So when the the crime starts to occur, like the snake gets loose in the house. So you got the criminals, and you got the black mamba. Is uh, there the tranny sub subplot or? There's no, why would there be a tranny subplot? Dog Day Afternoon. Oh Jeez. no, I'm talking all about right. it. No, because then there's a standoff of police outside. Okay, all right, gotcha. <laughs> I, I took the wrong part from Dog Day Afternoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm, Klaus Kinski uh, and Al Pacino plays a homosexual in it. <laughs> no, but Klaus Kinski and Oliver Reed fought the whole time on the set, and I mean they're two great character actors, and Oliver Reed just looks sweaty and drunk. Yeah. Through the whole thing. It's very good, though. And by the end of the movie, you're cheering for the snake. Cool. Yeah, good score, too. I'll check that out. I didn't... I, it's I, that streaming on Shudder. I didn't know that... Fuck them. I'm not doing... <laughs> I was I was going to do... You know who... That Nathan guy from Texas just messaged me Steinitz. today. Steinitz? Yeah, about doing a... Um, if I was going to submit another pitch to Shudder Labs. And I was like, no, thankfully... <laughs> thankfully, this spring, I'm actually working on things, so I don't need to... Sit there and put all my fucking eggs in that basket and check my email three times a night and all that bullshit. Oh, you did that so to yourself. Fuck I mean, them. I, I did, did it. Gave, you know what? In, in the hell with I did it to myself, asking. but they mishandled it. And fuck it. One of the winners was a BET fucking executive. That's bullshit. I, I, I don't. That's what drove me crazy about the whole Shutter Labs thing was like I hate when. And it's like I always talk about with podcasts when people start recommending podcasts to you. It's like, no, I want to find stuff that people don't know about. I don't want something that's produced with money behind yeah, it. Yeah, with like a writer for fucking Entertainment Weekly or some shit. Like, fuck that. Like, Beyond Yacht Rock's interesting because it is very low low budget, it feels like. 
and they are just kind of working stiffs. But JD has some Did clout. You? Yeah, because yeah. he dropped the he dropped that he wrote that script. That I'm sure they've they've been out there for that long. I'm sure they've had hands in things. But he was he mentioned on the one show that he was a writer for uh, Jack Black. The joke writer, yeah. And Jay, he's been around and he does voiceover work and he hangs out. I mean, when he, he met the man Coog. And he knew he, him and Harmon seemed to be buddies. How, how much what, did you did, have you watched the YouTube video the first time they met? He uh, he had Dan Harmon over at his house and he made him. It was like Super Bowl Sunday and he made him watch the Super Bowl with them, even though neither one of them liked football, just to be an asshole and make him feel uncomfortable. He recorded it all and it's on YouTube. No, it's I pretty haven't funny. Seen it. He, they have a bunch of they have a bunch of pilots that never made it past the first episode. Um, I think I sent you the link to one where they build like a fucking cork board. You, you know, I I've been meaning to go back and look at that one and I can't He's I a couldn't funny find it. I really hope that they, you know, part of the re- I I do the Patreon. I give them ten bucks. Okay, money. you do do it. Of course, I'm I a- almost did, but I just I'm can't. I'm, I've been cutting out all of my services. I can't be. I mean, I can't. I, be I finally, you know what I did? I canceled Fandor and I gave that ten bucks a month to, to fucking the Yacht Yacht Rock because I love that. It gives me entertainment twice a week. Fandor has been fucking useless lately, so I, they get my ten bucks. I thought about doing that, but then I said, you know what? I wrote about him for the Podmas on. Uh, AV oh, you give, yeah, you giving them tons of love. So, um, but I, I told JD, because that's who I in in contact with today. You go, you know, let me know if you see a boost in this, because I'm curious if an appearance on Podmas actually does anything. They said it was like 37. percent Wow, just from getting on uh, Podmas. I hope part of the reason they're doing the Patreon is because they want to go on tour. I would. Lo- and I told him they could all crash oh, here. Oh, you know they'll fucking come to shit. I'll get them Hilton rooms. <laughs> Fuck it. I, I got them thirty five bucks a night. I'll fucking put them all up. Jesus Christ! I'll do it for their whole tour. I could hook them up for that. That's true. You know what I mean? Like those guys are so awesome. Like that's consistent. Like Tuesdays and Thursdays or Tuesdays and Fridays are like the happiest days of my life because I know I'll drive to work listening to me. I it's right. it it's my favorite podcast on right now. I, I like Saturday Night Movie Sleepovers too. But yeah, like Rock's Joe, funnier. Joe Rogan's my other go-to one when he he has good people on sometimes. Um, but let's and see. I always like Brady Stadellis, but he isn't. He he, he kind of comes and goes. Coke yeah. breaks, or I don't know what the fuck he's doing. Hey. Oh my god. This hey, you wanted to be on this. You've been fighting with me to be on this podcast. This is what happens on this podcast. <laughs> when you're, Dan's you're, not you're, around. Kind, you're kind of just like Dan, actually. <laughs> I just have to like turn my nerd on. And then I got it, you know. I'm not a nerd. What the fuck are you talking you guys about? Are, you guys are like into sci-fi and shit. We have not mentioned one fucking science fiction movie the whole time. I'm just saying. Venom's about it. snakes. Yeah. So what? What is that classified under? Snake exploitation. It's uh, about snake horror? exploitation. I told you. Arbitrary film genres. Can we have it? I came up with that on my own. One more self-indulgent indulgent conversation. Yes, and then, and we'll, then we'll take a break. So I did um, that Cleveland uh, Moore, yes. a man who's been in your kitchen. Uh, he contacted me to shoot a uh, sketch. A man for... who kept leaving my fucking door open. Yes, he he contacted me to shoot a sketch for his improv troupe. I saw that was up. I yep. didn't I didn't watch it. It's two minutes long. It's I you'll you'll see a lot of it because I boosted the post on uh, Facebook. That stuff helps. I it was does. I was going through our numbers on the show, mm-hmm. and anything that we've like paid for the boost on. There's more downloads. Like Pay it's, for it. It's we'll right take there. turns. It's fucking ten bucks. It's like who gives a shit? Yeah. You gotta wait for a good one though. Oh yeah, you want to? You want to make you do sure one that, a month. You want to make sure that you have the content, and because we both have the second city thing, I was like, well, this is worth yeah. going. Um, but so I went over to his place in uh, Montrose, Montrose and Clark. I don't know whose parents are paying for that fucking apartment, <laughs> but neither one of these jagoffs, and uh, filmed the skit for him, and it was. It was really it, was, it. It turned out okay. It was pretty funny, but it was like the definitive working with improv kids experience, where you walk in the room and you introduce yourself to everybody, and they all give you a fake name, because <laughs> because they're playing fucking an improv game with you, and I'm just like, what is this? Jesus fucking Christ, guys! Like I'm here to fucking shoot you guys. Don't Jesus. don't fucking do this. Like, all right, hi, I'm Dusty. Hi, my name's Dusty too. Hi, my name's Dusty three, and it's like. Sounds like a crowd full of strokes. Uh, <laughs> truth. Truth. Yes. You've, truth. Hung out, you've, you've hung out with improv kids before. You're very before, perceptive. Huh? You're very, very perceptive. That's the bartender radar right there. Oh, fucking right. Boom. If I go to ask a guy what he wants to drink and he gives me some, he tries to make a fucking oh, shitty joke like that. Try to fucking like, make oh, a game out of it. This Jesus isn't a game, son. Christ. 
Get oh, the fuck out of here. Speaking of that, I waited on somebody the other night that said they knew you. Two, Ooh. Ni- two weeks in a row I was blessed with their presence. <laughs> Who the <laughs> hell was on it? On a Sunday. Boy or girl? A guy. Tried to take me out the first week. Second yes. Week, second week he realized he wasn't in my field. Who was it? Uh, well, some white guy named... Yeah, we... I, <laughs> Chris. I think he said his name was. Chris. Works at Drive Time. Chris from Drive Time? What the fuck's Drive Time? A cheap Golf. car dealership where people with 480 scores can get anything off the lot. Oh, he, he was trying to sell you on that, huh? Well, so no. why was it? Why wasn't he on your? He wasn't on my. He wasn't my thing. He he kept talking so loudly and abrasively. Uh, he was ridiculous. He kept saying how uh, it was nighttime and he knew that certain people were out at this particular. Oh Jesus! Oh my I'm God. not having this conversation he on this terrible. show. terrible. But he he embarrassed himself and I was like, you know, whatever. But he said he was a friend of Mike's, so that's. That's my only. That's that, comforting. That's my only problem with with moving to like those suburbs is that you get people that like talk like that, and that's they, how he was talking about everybody. Like, and, and they know. don't know to be embarrassed, or they don't know not to fucking well, do it. Christine and I, another another coworker of ours, we 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 have a similar issue where white people assume that because she and I are white, that we're racist. We agree with everything they have to yeah. say. <laughs> like, like, just come right out and say it, or you know, do that stupid thing with the hand, like. It's like, oh, come on, man. And you just kind of, hey, yeah, well, a lot of pe- different people out in the world, huh? No, I, I deal with that with contractors sometimes. Oh, oh, I can only I, I told my guys after the, the – we were in an elevator once and some guy – and it was, like, two electricians, and, like, one of them was black, and, like, the white one was, like, making fun of the black one. And I was like, all right, that's enough. And then he, like, looked at me, and then he got off the elevator, and I told my guys, I'm like, never. You never fucking talk like that. Because you know what? There's like this is this is my view because we have we have a very mixed engineering department. We have Hispanic, we have Italian, we have Irish, and you know Ugh, one dude's Italian. brother's gay and shit like that. And uh, goalie. <laughs> this is the way I look at it. If like I I mean it's okay to bust balls. It's totally okay to bust balls. But if you're not funny, and the joke's not funny, then it's like fuck you. You know what I mean? Exactly. If you're going to be funny about it and it's smart and it's an intelligent observation. And if you're friends. Or, or, exactly. You don't do it to a fucking stranger ever. But, like, if, you know, if, if the Italian kid's going to make fun of the Mexican kid and it's like, fuck you, you speck. Oh, no, no, no. That doesn't fly. Right. But if it's like, if it's, if it's playing, on, cu- playing humor, on cultural differences. Yes. Then, okay, fine. Then we can all, we can all be comedians here, but we cannot be racist. I used to, when I used to sell furniture. I worked with a woman named Heon Bloodgood. She was, I think, Korean. And um, there's another guy who used to work there. They'd worked together for 10, 20 years, and he would do dumb shit like, you know, do the squinty eyes thing. Oh, ding, 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 ding. And she would just kind of laugh it off. Well, then one guy, a new guy, started doing the same thing to her, <clears throat> and he got called in the office. Grown ass man, like in his 50s. And the manager had to sit. He's like, "Well, well, her and Tom were doing it. it was, her and Tom have worked with each other for ten, twenty years. She doesn't know who the hell you are. You can't just you're some random asshole. You're just being racist. Now. Making Jerry Lewis fucking jokes yeah. that aren't weren't funny then. And really <laughs> Coming in, funny you now. know, like um, Andy or Mickey Rooney, and that's what I meant. Representativity. Uh, Representativity. That's not Jerry Lewis. <laughs> no, that's, that's Mickey Rooney. All right, whatever. That's exactly what I meant. Hustler, word I pull the trigger long, grip my teeth, spray to every nigga's gone. Got my block sewn on my dope spots. Last thing I sweat, so suck a punk cop. Move like a king when I roll hop. You try to flex, bang, another nigga drop. You gotta deal with this, cause in the way out, why? Cash money ain't never gonna play out. I got nothing to lose, much to gain. In my brain, I got a capitalist migraine. I gotta get paid tonight. You motherfucking right, stick in my grip. Check my bitch, keep my game tight. So many hoes on my jock, think I'm a movie star. 19, I got a $50,000 car. Go to school, I ain't going for it. Kiss my ass, bust the cap on the Moet. Cause I don't wanna hear that crap. I'd rather be a new jack hustler. So we're celebrating an anniversary this week on, uh, Drinks on Monday. Uh, on March 8th, 1991, New Jack City was released to cinemas across uh, the United States. Uh, Mario Van Peebles' directorial debut from uh, writer Barry Michael Cooper and Thomas Lee Wright. Uh, so we all watched uh, New Jack City on Pat's suggestion. Uh, Carolyn, this has been a longtime favorite of yours. Uh, I'm a fan of all the ratchets. Nina Brown herself is here. Yes. 
Uh, now, um, Pat, why did you want to talk about uh, New Jack City? Because <clears throat> um, I knew, is it Carolyn or Caroline? Carolyn. I knew Carolyn. Everybody calls me. It. <laughs> I, I was just like. Everyone calls me Sharkisha. It's fine. Sharkisha? Yeah, okay. it's fine. We can go with Carolyn. Um, no, I figured, you know, I, I honestly, I, I, I hadn't seen it until last year when I caught it on VH1. And I've been trying to get Mike to watch it for a very long time. I've seen it. Really? You never had? Yeah, no, I watched it on cable like once years ago. Okay. And I liked it, but I never gave it Meanwhile, much. Meanwhile, I've been watching it since Pampers. Is this is this what is this a childhood favorite? Is there a lot of nostalgia in this one for you, Carolyn? Yeah, this one goes way back. This one, Belly Friday. So know. yeah, like Friday, I had seen. I was a big fan of the Singleton movies because I was like an art school kid when I was younger. Even though, in comparison, like, fuck John Singleton. Why didn't they let Mario Van Peebles do the remake of Shaft? Like that would have been the no brainer. You know what? <sighs> I, 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 that I don't know. I well, by the time the remake of Shaft had come around, uh, Van Peebles seemed to be on a downward slide because he hadn't had a hit in a he while. Yeah, no, Highlander three, and then kind of <laughs> he kind of he kind of just went back to doing acting. Yeah. I mean, he was always directing, but um, I don't think he had any interest in doing Shaft. I think he would have been a bigger fit, especially after watching New Jack City. Well, Singleton's an interesting character because like he started out like you know I. I I did something for the AV Club a couple of years ago about him that, you know, he had all this talent and all this career, and he just he just kind of squandered it and well, fucked it all I, up. I think he had, you know, it's interesting when you watch when you watch uh, New Jack City because it's East Coast, which is different than a lot of the Hood movies. A lot of the it's Hood movies West are West Coast, Coast yeah. Right. So you have that factor. And there was an the, explosion of them in 1991 because you had Boys in the Hood, you had Menace Society. You had Do the Right Thing, which was just a little bit before, which people don't consider a Hood movie, but when you think about it, it's it's New York. It's New York in 89. These movies, I guess, would be the hoodsploitation of Do the Right Thing. Well, Spike Lee elevates everything. And that's yeah. the thing is that like, Sp- like John Singleton was trying to be the California Spike Lee, right? And, you know, he succeeded, but I don't think he had the longevity of Spike Lee because Spike Lee had was a way better director and, like, knew how to do different shit. He was willing to experiment Singleton more. Singleton was very much, like, more, you know, painting with the same brush. And but, you know, Juice came out in early, early – no, Juice wasn't 91. Juice was 92, I want to say, which kind of fits in that same vein. Yeah. So, I mean, I was familiar with John Singleton. I was familiar with Spike Lee. I had seen Friday. I had seen, you know, don't most – Don't be a menace. Of course. So to the hood, you know, menace to the menace don't society, menace to and then the, the menace Brothers. society is a great one. Menace yeah. Cyber is from the Hughes brothers, who also did one of my favorite modern black exploitation movies, Dead Presidents. Yes, which is where Chris think... Tucker is in Dead Presidents. I think. Oh yeah, everybody's yeah. In, everybody's in Dead Presidents. Right. But New Jack City is. Uh, yeah, Juice came out in '92, the following year. It's based on real life stuff. Yeah. That really happened. Yeah, as far as, you know... Um, well, the the script was written by... The original script was written by uh, Thomas Lee Wright, who, as Pat mentioned earlier, was... Um, he wrote the first draft of The Godfather, Godfather 3. Three. yeah. He was a playwright. A, a white guy. Um, he uh, the, only mo- the only movie he was really... Other movie before this, his only other credit is Last of the Finest, which is a L- LAPD war on drugs movie with Chicago favorite Brian Dennehy. Um, but then uh, Q... Quincy Jones brought in uh, Quincy Jones. Quincy, he says, hey, Michael Cooper. <laughs> Barry Michael Cooper, I like the article you wrote about New Jack Swing and the Village Voice in 1988. Will you come and redo this script for me? And uh, my, Barry Michael Cooper, who um, kind of coined the term New Jack Swing in 1988. Which uh, Tony Tony Tone then went and made. <laughs> well, uh, it, 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 if you look at it, um, he was writing an article about Teddy Riley, who was an R&B producer and founder of Guy. And guy shows the band guy shows up in New Jack City. Mm-hmm. Riley had produced Keith Sweat's '87 debut, and that's where the New Jack blueprint was laid down. The music was upbeat, smooth hooks, an yes. abundance of soul. Yeah. Um, but it was this was all predating gangsta rap a little bit. Um, that's why they keep working in money in the in the score of the film. Yeah, you know what I mean. And uh, Barry Michael Cooper had also he also ended up writing Above the Rim, Sugar Hill, and set it off. Was it shut it off? Set it off. No, I just saw that pop up somewhere. I don't know. I, I, I didn't see him listed on that one, but it was definitely above the rib and Sugar Hill. So I think he brought kind of the authenticity. Like I imagine the white guy script was more like when you see all the 80s like cop tropes in New Jack City and a lot of the more exploitive elements. Judd Nelson. Judd Nelson has the, his role <laughs> in that movie to fucking uh, – he gets to thank him for that. And um, I think he brought more of like uh, the more urban – 
uh, styling to it. Um, and it, was, it came out in 91. I don't know. if I don't think it was a hit. Like, no, it absolutely was. Was it? It had a $7 million budget, and, it, and they... Uh, it made way more made, than that. Made, for, made $46 million off it. Uh, anything else? Oh, yeah, I, I, I mean, because I think... And in 91, I mean, I would say that's yeah, probably a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, just for inflation. Well, it was an independent film, too. Yeah. And it kind of, if you look at it, it also kind of uh, signals the coming of independent cinema. Because if you look at a lot of the major Hollywood releases that came out that year, it was a lot of prestige pictures and dumb comedies. Yeah. Like, you didn't see a lot of good action... Or uh, like genre this is, pictures. This is Doubtfire. Like, yeah. Uh, the Straight talk. The corny white people. Straight talk with Dolly Parton. Has anybody ever seen that movie? Straight talk. Straight. I remember the theme song. <laughs> I could sing most of it to you right now. So, Carolyn, why don't you tell us what New Jack City is about? <laughs> oh, you're going to... Recount the plot for us. Right. Okay. New Jack City. Um, basically, Nino Brown, who is... One Played by Wesley, Wesley Snipes. Snipes. Yes. Uh, in his debut film role. Was a... Cocaine. Get the fuck out. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. Debut film. Yeah. I think he had done maybe television or something, but it was definitely That's his... what put him on the map. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. So Nino Brown, big time Coke dealer, learns that he can make more money selling crack cocaine in the projects, takes over the projects building. The Carter. The yeah. Carter, correct. Uh, closes it's it worth down. noting that this film is set in 19, even though it was shot in 81, yes, it's, it's shot in 1986. It's a period piece. Right. So takes over the project buildings. Uh, you know, forces people out of their homes so he can basically turn it into, like, a drug trap house. Kind of like where we're at now. <laughs> <laughs> Something similar. <laughs> um, you know, has a couple friends that he's got working with him, turns against them. It, it's basically stuff that happened that was happening back in the 80s and 90s. That, that was a big thing. And so I think they tried to highlight it and make it, you know, what it was. Yeah, because um, they – oh, I'm sorry. What were we going to say? I was going to say, well, like, they have, like – the the lawyer or whatever that's like you know knows the business end of things they have his type of character <clears throat> they have one of his lieutenants that gets hooked on crack right after Pookie. he steals his bitch no I, not, no not Pookie not Pookie who are you talking guy, about the one that contributes to his downfall the guy that where he steals his girlfriend oh um G money yeah where like you know he starts smoking and it affects his decisions right and, um <laughs> or when Nino Brown cancels that bitch. His girlfriend. So I mean, it's a, it's 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 very much like a 1930s mob movie in that. Except it, the mobsters have like the lines in their eyebrows. Well, they're going against the mobsters in there. Yeah, and they do have a throwback to Godfather when they have the massacre at the wedding. I, yes, I thought yeah. that was kind yeah. of yeah. Yeah, that but, yeah. but it's but it's about the rise and fall of Nino Brown. Ultimately, though, at the end, um, the undercover cop Ice T. He, uh, it comes out that his mother was killed by Nino Brown, and then when he first started drug dealing, yeah. he shot. He had to go and kill somebody, and so he killed Wesley Snipes. Ki- inadvertently killed his mother. He killed Ice T's mother, and you know, which is a little too Star Wars for me. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was like, and so then in return, he was killed at the end of the trial. By, by uh, I forgot the actor's I name. I know. So. Who's still alive? He's still alive and kicking at eighty two. I I never seen this movie before. I, like I said, I watched Singleton movies. I had seen all the all the uh, West Coast hood movies from the nineties, and I caught it on VH one. And it was the opening shot that was like made me realize I was in a hotel room with Jill. I don't know where the fuck we were, but it was like was it when they were hanging the white yes, guy upside because down? Because you see the classic ni- early nineties opening credits thing where you get like helicopter shots of the city. Mm-hmm. But this one shot just keeps zooming in, and it keeps zooming in, and then you see Wesley Snipes hanging this corny white motherfucker. Actually, off the somebody bridge. else was hanging him, and then Wesley Snipes told him to drop him because he didn't have any uh, money, and he uh, dropped him right in the river. <laughs> and his girlfriend was hollering in the background. <laughs> yeah, it was. And then it cuts from that to Ice T trying to do a drug deal with Chris Rock. Chris Rock tries to get away. Poopy. And there's these Dutch angle close ups of their eyes, and then when Chris Rock is running, he he there's like a Public Enemy playing or whatever, or, or that fucking Queen Latifah track they keep playing, mm. and he smacks into some white dude carrying groceries, and cornflakes explode all over the place, and I was like, God damn it, this is a fucking good movie, like they're hit, like this is this is exploitation, this is like really fucking good '90s exploitation, and then I pulled up my phone and I was like, Who the fuck directed this? And then I saw Marvi- Mario goddamn Van Peebles, son of Melvin Van Peebles, who did Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song. His uh, directorial debut, too. Before that, he had done a lot of acting, yeah. uh, Mario Van Peebles, uh, most notably in 1984's The Exterminator 2. 
playing the big bad in that one. He's good in that one, too. And he directed a lot of episodes of 21 Jump Street, which is where, kind of where he oh, cut his teeth. So he knew the street. Yeah. <laughs> you love that movie. I love 21 it was t- Jump It's based on a TV, TV show. show I love 22 Jump Street, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, and it, so you can definitely see the exploitation uh, bug is in the blood the way from they his shot dad. It, it was, yeah. he, he shoots it way better. It's just it's it's, very stylized. It's visually appealing. You yeah. can watch that movie, and it doesn't matter what goofy shit is going on with the storyline. Like the mobsters look crazy. Like, like it's it it pops. It's got flair. It's got panache. And I, what I like about that, it's like for lack of a better word, like the style and the exploitative nature. With a lot of the action, a lot of the '80s cops tropes and everything like that, is kind of the spoonful of, for lack of a better word, sugar that helps the medicine go down. Because there is, I mean. The best exploitation movies do have some sort of message, message. about the society, yeah, yeah. and uh, it was the 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 crack epidemic was a real thing in the eighties, and it was. I mean, they I mean they almost basically flat out say it in lines of dialogue about how it destroys communities. Yeah, but if that's what it takes to get people, I mean, you know, a slick action movie to get people to say, "Oh, there's a real problem with drugs," so be it. The Chris Rock rehab montage is the only time when I felt that it was a bit much. Like, I could deal with the courtroom bullshit at the end, mm-hmm. but it was like the Pookie's, like, rehab. Was, I don't want to be here. Ah, but you needed it. You needed it for his character. Because his character is kind of what sets everything into motion. Yeah. And then I love, I, they, go to a, they go to a funeral or something a, after the wedding. <laughs> and Mar- it's Pookie's funeral. Mario Van Peebles is like, we spent so much money. Like when they when they have that like that the ill fated drug raid mm-hmm. on the was it the Cardiff or the Carter Cardiff? and Pookie ends up dead. Yeah, a bunch of people end up dead. And they're at Pookie's funeral. And, and Pookie. uh, Melvin Van, Mario Van Peebles is like, you know, how we spent tens of thousands of dollars on this, and a bunch of cops got killed, so we're getting shut down. And then Ice T's like, I don't give a shit how much money we spent. Never mind the fact that like cops were killed in this botch raid. Like, you think that would be the thing that would be weighing on his mind more than anything? Is that, like, yes, me, you, Judd Nelson, and this fucking Asian guy totally killed, like, a dozen cops. That was the only element where I was like, this is grossly unrealistic. No, he wanted justice for his mother. Exactly, because Donna was mom. He was very one-minded. Yeah. yeah. And he has that great line at the end, I want to kill you, my, I want to kill you so bad my dick is hard. Or something yes. along those yeah. lines. Yeah, that, but that was all. That's all realistic stuff. And that all did, you know, basically. And then they disarm a bomb. <laughs> what? <laughs> then they disarm the bomb. Pull the green wire. Pull the blue wire. I love it. That, that's yeah, the I mean, 80s it action like trope. Covered everything. There. It was like tango and cash kind of. And you also see, uh, like, I'm surprised Mario Van Peebles has never done a straight horror movie, which I'm surprised at because you can kind of see, um, like, that he'd probably be, bring some visual panache to it. Uh, particularly when he's in the scenes where Pookie is being tempted by the crack pipe. Right. So not to sound ignorant, but the person that actually wrote that movie, he's still alive. He doesn't write movies anymore, obviously. Or he does write movies. Has he done every, anything since New Jack City? Uh, no. No. Um, the the white guy, uh, he wrote, uh, he did a documentary about uh, the Crips, I think. Yeah. Because I, a, I lot, a lot of the problem is, like... Uh, and Barry Michael Cooper, I mean, he's just got, like, three film credits to his name. But he, I think he still writes. Right. Like, how... Uh, what is it? Spike Lee. How he did that Chirac video. I like Chirac. The, the movie... Well, a lot of people... It had a lot of bad... Uh, a lot of people didn't dig it, but they didn't get it, I don't bad think. Bad reviews about it because a lot... Because what they showed was not realistic. Until you, you live in the city and you, you live what they live... They're going to be upset until you can actually portray what they're living. He kind of like sugarcoated it and can't and like made it so it would appeal to the people going to, to the video, not to actually highlight what's really going on in the city. Well, Chirac was also modeled around a Greek tragedy, wasn't it? Right. Like, it it oh, made yeah. it more of like a, yeah. a like a joke than anything. And I think a lot of people thought, okay, Chirac, somebody's actually going to put out there what's what we're really living with. Day in and day out, but it wasn't like you that. Can't, you never can't count keep on making... Spike Lee to come and save your ass about anything. And you I... can't keep making movies that just like, well, yeah, this is how awful it is. Like, he made a movie that was Chirac, the same way they did with New Jack City, um, and in a lot of ways, uh, what we were talking about earlier, Get Out, where you use fantasy or action or filmmaking uh, to put a more visually interesting spin. It's an allegory. Like, right. it doesn't have to show, like, Chirac didn't have to be this movie, this hardcore drama about 
people getting uh, shot in the streets. Because, as Roger, like Roger Ebert mentioned in his review of New Jack City in 1991. Yeah. Well, he was talking about how Truffaut said that you can't make a true anti-war movie because movies are going to make war look exciting. Yeah. And it's the same thing. Like You can't really make an anti-drug movie because... The lifestyle of the drug dealers. Wolf of Wall Street right there. Like, it kind of appeals to you until the third act when they finally get gunned down. Yeah. At least New Jack City, it depicted everything it was supposed to depict. Like, it they, it was everything that everybody probably would have thought it was supposed to be as far as showing, like, drug raids and, like, drug uh, drug lords and, like, everything that, that they go through in the setup and everything like that. That was real-life stuff. That's what really happens. So I think people were looking for a new age New Jack City. Well, one of the things that New Jack City touches on at the end, which I liked in Wesley Wesley Snipes' His speech. speech in the courtroom, was that he's not responsible for the crack epidemic. The fucking CIA is. You they have no, I mean? We don't have poppy fields. Yeah, like, we're not. Like, he's the fucking dude selling the shit, but it, it was definitely the government that was bringing it in from overseas and what we know he now is slightly responsible for selling it no no, no he, he is for number two remember he was poisoning essentially the girlfriends that he had like when they weren't doing what he, he wanted them to do he would put heroin in their little bags and then they would be That's hooked what on you gotta it and do would... sometimes to keep bitches alive. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, i'm glad pat brought that up because i mean i think that's a testament to new jack city uh it, it does attempt to bring to light the crack ed- epidemic that was going on through the 80s and the 90s. But it also suggests that there are no easy answers. Like, yeah, you can stop Nino Brown, but the crack's still coming in. Right. I mean, at the very least, he is a, a businessman who has found a way to make money Absolutely. on crack. Well, look at our drug laws. Like, it, it, crack is such... If you look at, like, have, if you have, like, an ounce of crack versus an ounce of Coke... It's you, it, you, it's it's a quadruple. Yeah. And it's the like, time. and when you think about it, crack is just a fucking watered down version of coke. So why isn't the penalty harsher for having Want me to tell that you, amount Pat? of coke? Of, I fucking know. I can tell you because, it's because you, the government hates black people. No, that's them. not true. It's because it's been the it's, addictive. It's been cooked and it's been you, you've put more process into it than you have with cocaine. You actually have. There's I can't really talk about pr- it. Addictive. No, and, 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 I just I'm speculating. Of course, co- at one hundred percent. I, I smell some cinnamon in there. No, it one hundred percent goes down race lines. It has. Yeah, I understand Absolutely. what you're saying. Is that yes? There's yeah, crack's been processed from coke, but I think it has to do with if you're going to pull over someone with crack versus you're going to pull over someone with coke. The person you're going to pull over with coke is probably going to be a white dude, and the versus the person you're going to pull over with crack, who's going to be a fucking black dude, and it's like who do you want to put in jail longer? And that's why the fucking the sentencing is what is what it is, and that was the only thing I think that was missing from that courtroom scene. Was him echoing that, but I don't know if it was like that at the time. Right. I, I hate when movies end in a courtroom scene. Courtroom. I, re- I read once that as far as screenwriting goes, like a courtroom scene at the end is just it's lazy. When it's you like don't, the whole thing he was talking to his therapist. Yeah, you know, when, it's like right there. when you don't know what else to do. And that actor's name was Bill Cobbs, who finally shoots Nino Brown. And the movie kind of gives you a little more of a satisfying conclusion because Ice-T... The cops gets, didn't kill him. The cops didn't kill him. It was somebody from the community yes, who'd been exactly. gunning for him for a while. And that was the old man. Bill Cobbs. One of my favorites who... Who kept I mean, asking the police to get involved. To Del Paxton. Him. That's right. He was Del Paxton. Yeah, I remember right. him from People Under the Stairs. Oh, okay. Uh, his first movie was Taking a Pelham 1, 2, 3. Oh, the Shaw one? The first R-rated movie ever? Yes, with... Fuck all over that movie. Yeah. Which you know, I saw. Uh, I saw Logan, and as far as working the fucking goes, a lot, of, a lot of hubbub has been made about the fact that this is an X Men movie where you see Professor X and, Lo- and Wolverine saying fuck and shit, and it doesn't. It feels completely natural. I think it's like blown out of proportion. Well, I if I, I'm going to go see Logan, it looks real good. But I, it's like Shane. It's like a, it's a western. I have too many. Good. There are too many grown ass men in my feed who get all jazzed up when a superhero movie's rated R. Like, like I can I, I, if you're 15, I guess why you're excited about seeing an R-rated movie. I just don't care that. Much. I had to do the double feature because I know Kong Islands this weekend. I'm going to take Connor to see that because it's less than two hours. And we're going to go to the place where they serve you food. Um, and then we start movie season, dude. And you got to be on top of shit because it's going to be something every fucking week you got to yeah. see. But my, I guess my last question for the group is, and this doesn't necessarily pertain to New Jack City, but as far as 90s gangster rap, the movies, the music, everything, East Coast versus West Coast. Uh, 
That's a tough call. I East Coast. It is. Probably get Public Enemy in New Jack City. Spike Lee. West Coast, o- West Coast always seemed more fun, though. Yeah. But those, those are the people that got killed. Are you West Coast or East Coast? I don't know. I'm South Side. This is the sound that we ponder and get down. Everyone must know. Been here before, now we're gonna give you more. It's time to let. We would discuss <laughs> Danielle Bergoli, the Cash Me Outside girl. And I just I found out who she was a little late to the game. A uh, friend of the, sh- the podcast, Ashley Kawasas. I was at, I, I forgot how it came to you. Oh, you don't know who that is? I'm like, no. We put on the videos. Of and, course, uh, Ashley from Dalton. Knows oh, Ashley from Dalton knew who the fuck this girl was. And uh, I'm assuming Derek Brash knows who she is because he is always watching Dr. Phil. He's offended by her, which we're going to get to that. We're okay, because I can't tell when he's watching Dr. Phil if he's fucking with me or if he's really into it. Like, Derek is a, he has week, Derek's he has, a trip. He has the occasional weekday <laughs> off, I think, so he's, he watches that daytime TV where he's subjected <laughs> to this shit. So um, what do we know about Diana Bregoli? Well, wh- Not Diana. Who? What's her name? Danielle. Danielle Bregola. Bregoli. Sure. Well, we know that she's 13 years old. <laughs> she got uh, a birthday coming up. Right. She'll be 14 on the 20. What is it? 20th? Fourth. Yeah. I'm so <laughs> glad you know that, Pat. It's in his date book. Yeah. Um, let's see. We know she beats her mom up. She smokes with cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> she does hood rat things with her friends. And uh, no surprise to anybody, she's from Florida. She makes, uh, well, she's asking for $30,000. Um, like appearance fees? Yeah, appearance fees to <laughs> hang out with people. You know, meet and greets, thirty grand. So this, 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 this little girl showed up on Dr. Phil because she beats her mile up. And uh, Dr. Phil tried to help her and by exploiting her on the first show and then sending her off to some ranch to ride horses and shit. And then uh, she came back on Dr. Phil's show and let uh, Dr. Phil know that she was much like Oprah. In that she made Dr. Phil. Absolutely. Why are we talking why are we talking about this little bimbo? I think I think it was the thirty thousand dollar appearance fee that kind of caught my interest in the fact that people had actually paid for her to do appearances. Because, you know, a, something like that it kind of reminds me of um when I was really big into comic book collecting, is that you know, someone could tell you that the first Iron Man comic is worth five thousand mm-hmm. dollars. But unless you find somebody to pay you $5,000 for the first Iron Man comic, it ain't worth shit. Well, that's where it comes in, Pat. She's, her net worth <laughs> is 150000 So obviously she's found five idiots <laughs> that have since... Uh, Paid her $30,000 to appear. Right. So is, is that on her or is that on us? Because I think that what that means is that it's on us. Because Absolutely. we as a culture raise these people up to the position where they can demand this kind of money for absolutely nothing. You know, one of the things I wanted to research for the segment, which I totally didn't do, but whatever, was the, um, you know, they're raping our kids, they're raping our mamas, they're raping our sisters, that guy. Yes. He, someone had... Another viral sensation. A a DJ had contacted him Mm -hmm. and took that sound bite and turned it into some kind of, like, song. The same thing they did with Daniel Bregoli with her Cash Me Outside. And they turned it into a song they sent on iTunes for $1.29, and then, boom, they make a bunch of money off it. So is it is she the idiot for for being who she was to create this kind of yes. sample in the first place? Or is it all of us that then turn around and then buy the fucking song for a dollar twenty nine a dollar? It's absolutely society. That's, so it's they've like created these animals. 
Well, yeah, it's it's kind of like a, 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 a cyclical thing because we we create these animals, I think, because as much – I didn't know she was 13. Like, I follow her on Instagram now. And so like, does seven other million people. Yeah, but she does not look 13. But the fact that she has seven million followers for saying, cash me outside, how about that? Yeah. But the thing, I mean, and I think the thing you have to remember about this girl is we're talking about her right now in a Drink Some Monday podcast. What's the date today? What's today's date? March 8th. March 8th? March 8th, 2018. No one's going to remember who this person no, is. No, absolutely. Or maybe they will. She's since been in a future uh, music video. You know what, though? It's all, it's, all, it's all flash in the pan, and this has been going on. I'm assuming it's probably been going on in the beginning of time. I can't remember anything from, like, the 60s or 70s, but maybe, like, like something, like, as dumb as, like, where's the beef? I did, I did read an article on the Internet, which, you know, debate its validity, but that there was a development deal for a couple reality shows and then a, a the potential for a scripted show as well. But, I mean, okay, so even taking They're trying that, to hit it hard right now. Taking that into consideration, when's the last time you heard from Spence, Spencer and Heidi Pratt? Right? Tia, oh. Tequila. Tia Tequila. Yeah. Like, there was another one who kind of came Flav. and went. Well, he, well, he was Flav. in New Jack City, coincidentally enough. I know, as a DJ, <laughs> yeah. but... I'm mean, just going with to say, With that white like, girl that he was fucking around with. They had yeah. all those things. Uh, the girl who was in love with him, Delicious, or whatever her name was. No, it was... Uh, Brigitte Nielsen. Yeah. <laughs> from, the, from Rocky IV. I yeah. Mean, and the, but even Chuck D was like, you're a fucking jester now. You're a joke, the fact that you're doing this. Um, so I think, but I he's think, making money. So and I that's think, their bottom line. As far as, you know, what is it? it it's, it's March 8th, 2017. March 8th, 2018, we might still be talking about her. Give Let's it, remember this show. Give it another year after that. It, if she gets that TV deal and if she's got a good reality show, maybe she'll be on for a little bit. But then after that, who knows, maybe we won't. But you could say that about a lot of actors in Hollywood. and you know, I'm just wondering how she's going to do that. And she dropped out of the seventh grade. Like, she doesn't even have an education, so we're going to... I mean, I'm sure she has all the time in the world to film since she's not a... Well, but she doesn't have any talent. What's no, interesting? She no doesn't talent. have any talent. She's an idiot. That's the problem. What's interesting is that no one seems to be holding the parents responsible for Absolutely this. Absolutely Especially when you have a kid. I think every, doesn't everybody hold the parents responsible? Like, I mean, we no, all immediately not. said... Not in the court of public the, opinion. That's, I, because that's the, whole, the parents' fault. The whole, the, whole, the whole angle of the Dr. Phil show was that my daughter's out of control, blah, 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 blah. And they've been doing those shows since Jenny Jones. And then. they bring the daughter on, and the daughter acts like an idiot. Mm-hmm. And so all the hate goes towards the daughter. But when do you stop and look at the parents and say, how did you let your kid get this out of control? When it, we Before we did the show, we watched some YouTube videos with her, and she did a morning show. She know. seemed relatively well-spoken on that morning yeah, show a, that we were watching. It's a joke. Her Ebonics is like a switch on and off. Yeah. Reminds me of someone I know. But yeah. when, when, when she did that morning show, she was doing, she was doing a radio show, <laughs> and her mom had driven her to the radio show, and her mom's in the audience, and... Carolyn made the uh, astute observation that she had that haircut that, how would you describe it? Oh, yes, the mom. She's got the, uh, you know, the typical I date a black man haircut. <laughs> every every white chick that has that little asymmetrical hair with the blonde and the black <laughs> skunk in the back obviously dates a black man. And, so then she, and, she, and she also wants to speak to your manager. Yes. Oh, and that's, I want to speak to your manager. Like, oh, so, yeah, it has many different forms that it comes in. Because my husband had a problem with the service today, and he's not going to pay the bill, so I'm going to be the one to break the news. Right. That's the one. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, as society, you know, they made it acceptable for, for kids to act like that. And so. Well, because a lot of kids that age who don't have any talent or, you know, uh, you know, any brains, they think that by acting a fool like that, they could become the next. Uh, Danielle uh, Bergoli. D- Dana Bragala. Yeah. She's so memorable, Mike can't even remember her name. <laughs> she is kind of, it was kind of funny, though, when she told Dr. Phil that she made her. That was good. Yeah. That she made him. That was funny. But her dad has start, since started a GoFundMe page. He's trying to raise money to help save his daughter. Save, her, save his daughter from what? Like making a bunch of money or being exploited? Well, I think the, par- the parents should are probably going to end up stealing that money. Like, they always absolutely. do. They've they been doing that do. since Dennis I mean, the they, Menace. Yeah, if they do, if they do that to fucking, you know, Hannah Montana and shit, and uh, what's his name, Kevin McAllister, you know, that poor, that poor kid. Yeah. He was another one. You Too know, bad he Michael was... Jackson's not alive. They could have made another hundred thirty thousand oh. dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he'd be interested in her though. I, mean, I don't. Got I mean, the wrong plumbing. Oh god. Oh god. Jesus Christ. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to create content, motherfucker. Sorry. <laughs> And what else is there to say about this little this little minx? Well, we know that she's not going to be successful. I think that's just where people are interested in this, this flash in the pan stuff that doesn't really amount to much and, and 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 all that. I think it's just that's just where our disposable media is going is that people are just interested in these things that pop up and they're hot for a minute and it's it's a meme and it's it's all on face. I mean, there's there's a well there's a there seems to be like there's almost like a uh, you know like. It hits all the beats. Like, there's the appearance, there's the meme, there's the remix video, uh, there's the interview that humanizes them, uh, there's the uh, cameo in a real low budget movie, and then and they're a gone. Movie. Yeah. And the, the next, you know, yeah. yeah. In Scary the Star movie Wars. So she'll, she'll be in that Star Wars parody that the. Uh, Scary movie the, news are this, doing. Yeah, yeah. She'll be in there somewhere. And. Ten years from now, when somebody's watching that movie, they'll have to look up online, like, what What was that? I don't get that. Yeah. Well, the fact that nobody sees anything wrong with anything that's going on is a little disturbing. I think a lot of people see what's going on. But we like to, we as a society, we do like to laugh at those that are less fortunate. And let's face it, this girl is less fortunate than a lot of us. And I, think I that- imagine she comes from, not impoverished, but I'm going to say probably lower, lower class part of you know, the country known as Florida. And... A lot of people like to laugh at that. Like, oh, we're not, we're not like that. We can laugh at that. And it, I think it's, it's a the, sideshow kind of thing. It's the mother, you know, actively exploiting her children because you know she brought. She was the one that contacted the Dr. Phil show in the first place. She's the one that brought her kid on. If I had a problem with my kid, I'm not dragging her ass on TV. I'm not gonna make you. You're not gonna make me look like an idiot on TV. I'm not gonna have my kid motherfuck me on Doctor Phil, so that I could get a bunch of oohs and ahs from the audience, and everyone could see my face. Or you're not gonna get beat up because she beat she beat the mom up I'll essentially beat the fuck on the out TV. Of my daughter, are you kidding oh, me? Oh god! But I'm saying she beat the mom up, and so like this all goes back to the same thing. Um, Cause you're a parent, like would you ever? I mean, no, my kids would be missing their teeth. I'd probably drag them from one. Your kids are very well behaved. They are because they. I they believe, must take I after. In, they must take after their father. I believe in ass whoopings. <laughs> yes. I mean, not be, don't. I'm not talking about the kind you don't of torture. Like, you not beating, beat your, beating him with the belt. Don't beat your kid down. You don't put their hand know. on the stove and then throw them in the closet for three days. But like, no. Yeah. They, if you're an adult and you're into it, that's cool. You should. Your kid should have the fear of fucking God in you. Like I Absolutely. got the dad voice where I'm like, hey, and that's all it takes, and then everyone, everything fucking stops. <laughs> You know what I mean? And like, like what am I gonna? I'm not gonna hit him in the frying pan, but like, but they you know. know. Yeah, and it's like that. That's I give a look. Actually, I give the look. Mom's like the really side good eye, at the look. And, and then, uh, you know, my kids will say, "Oh, my mom's giving me the look. I gotta go." <laughs> She's giving me the look. How old is your oldest kid? I have eleven, a ten, and a six. Eleven, Jesus Christ! Yeah, she's real sassy lately, and that's and so like this is the time like. The time, even six, seven, eight years old, that's where you have to start nipping it. Because then I'm going to have a 13-year-old that's going to try to fight me. I'm going to have to... Bring her on Dr. Phil? I'm going to have to bury him. No, exactly. You're not going to bring her on Dr. Phil. You're going to beat the fuck no, out I'm of him. No, I'm not going to bury... Uh, yeah. Right. But then I, this goes, so I can share my little situation. I have a sister who is 19 years old. She has some si- uh, some type of entitlement. Like if the world owes her something. <laughs> but this is what most kids these age, this is what they feel. It's like their generation. They feel like we owe them something. Like, oh, I shouldn't go to work. What do you mean? I'm 18 years old. I'm in high school. You should be paying for all my stuff. No, on the contrary, sister girl. You should have had a job when you were 16. Get your ass out there and figure it out. I had a job when I was 14. Yeah, that's the, but that's the you know, it's harder for, it's hard. You know what? It is harder to hire teenagers these days, though. It is unfortunate because a lot of those jobs that we had when we were 16 or 17 years old. They're like 35-year-old dudes. Yeah, yeah, they're being filled by because we're a service, ser, service industry society now. Yeah. And it's a, it's sad. It sucks. That yeah, sucks. That's the best way to say it. You know, I, w- I was explaining to my mom. My sister dropped out of high school, came home, got a, a, a dead-end job making $8 an hour, and then three weeks later they bought her a brand-new car. Because that's showing what? That if you drop you dropped out, of, out of high school? Or, I mean, college. Oh. If that's saying, if you drop out of college, we paid for you to go for a year and a half. You only had <laughs> half a semester to go, and you'd have a d- associates. associates. Least, yeah. Instead of doing that, you want to drop out of college, and then you're going to come home. And don't you worry. We're going to give you a free room and board and a brand-new car. You're the lucky contestant on your parents are an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean.
mean, seriously, it's 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 a double standard for so sure. That's how that's how the Diana Bregolis of the world are created. Yeah, but imagine if you had one of those little shitheads living in your house, and then you had the ability to charge thirty thousand dollars to hang out with her. Like what, what it, it's like creating a monster. When you thirty thousand dollars, though, that's a lot of money. Out, when you pimp your kid out, be like, fuck it. Well, es- essentially, that's what manage. The we doing. don't call pimp; we call manage. I, th- I think that's it's a management I, decision. No, I mean thirty thousand dollars. I better at least get a hand job out. Do of you that. not think? Do you not think that that's what the mom's doing, Dora? She's I mean, collecting a check. Oh, she's for sure. exactly she's what exploiting her. Doing. Yeah. That's exactly. What I mean, doing. sometimes I wonder if like. Like the mom when she brought her on Doctor Phil, did she was she kind of crossing her fingers, knowing that we have a tradition of people going on these goofy talk shows and reality shows and becoming famous for being dumb? Was she kind of crossing her fingers and hoping that her daughter was going to say something that would make her a viral you sensation? Know what, you know who would be a good follow up for that question is Katie Wright because when she did her time on uh, it's on Springer, Jerry Springer, right. like yeah. I'm sure maybe they tell these people like look. If you do good and you create, you do some outlandish shit, we'll pay to have you back. You know what I mean? And this could be a stepping stone, or you could do other stuff. I mean, is, so is her mom like- that savvy? I don't, I don't know, but definitely the models there, to where it's not completely unheard of that you know these things. Because why else would you go on Doctor Phil versus just going to Maury? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or just going going to a fucking private Lori. office, like you know, taking her to the scared straight program. Dude, I paid one hundred fifty dollars people... for the DNA test. I didn't bring no one on fucking more. Are you kidding me? No. We'll settle this shit in my living room like a dog. But some of these, <laughs> but they get paid for that, correct? Well, they get flown. They, you know, you don't get paid for being on Maury. You get uh, hotel and airfare, and it's a good weekend. You know, what here's I mean? something like, I found out about um, Judge Judy that if you appear on Judge Judy, like you don't pay whoever loses, you don't no, no, pay no, right, that yeah. money. Judge Mathis is the same way. They the 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 studio, the company that produces the producers right. pay off every everybody gets paid. Right, right. right. Oh, so whatever I, we did because I did Judge so Mathis, they, you might as well go to a small claims. Like, yeah, go, no, that's, go why they, that's take, why they bring their cases to him because it's like okay, if and that's why they was counter sue. Because they figure, all right, well, that way I get money back, too. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you, this whole thing is squashed. This person gets paid. I'm going to counter sue for some bullshit reason. I'll so get you paid. get paid. I get flown out. I get to spend the weekend in Chicago, which, if you're not from Chicago, is a big deal. Yeah. And, yeah, that, that's exactly why they do it. I want to sue somebody for being subjected to Danielle Bergoli. Do you want to come up with some <laughs> shit? Because there's, there's a long history of people that have come up with shit. Just to get on those fucking TV What about shows. the guy that uh, burned himself with hot coffee from McDonald's? Boom, millionaire. Actually, that was a uh, that, that story. Like, if you actually do the research, uh, it, it was from the nineties. It was, an, it was an elderly woman. Like, she honestly had like third degree burns all over her body. Like, yeah, the joke was it was coffee was supposed to be hot, but if you do the research, like it was it was negligence on McDonald's part to serve coffee that hot. So, if the three of us were to come up with some kind of fucking gimmick or scheme to get on Jerry Springer. Or Judge Mathis. But the thing about Judge Mathis is it actually has to be in court. Like, they look at, like, you have to actually file. But you know how to do that. <laughs> we right? could we could figure something out. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're a jack of all trades. You're a reverend. <laughs> so what, what what would our scam And they know how to steal, reverend. Yeah, yes, yeah. you do. Yes, Pass you can start your church. <laughs> you can start your church. <laughs> the first church in a pepper. I took, I, I took, this, I took a fucking a PA head to, to a pawn shop once. This was years and years and years ago. A what? A PA head. And uh, Who's speaker PA system, head was a speaker it? system. We'll talk about this all It later. was Mike's. And no, it wasn't. It wasn't. And I thought um, I wondered like, I thought I No, th- I don't know. <laughs> but I take it to the and, and the pawn shop was like, nah, it's broken. I'm like, the fuck it is. We just used it last week and it works fine. And he's like, nah man, this shit's broken. And I'm like, all right, fuck you, and I left. And then the dude came out to me in the parking lot. He's like, look. I want to buy that PA head off you. <laughs> I'm trying to start a church. And I was like, oh, well, if it's for God, I'll give it to you for 75 bucks. He's like, all right, come back here on Friday when I get paid. You got the PA head, I'll give it to you. He's trying to bucks. start a church at the I, pawn shop? I, 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 hey, man, everyone's got to have a day job. I understand. Wait, oh. by, by chance, was this on Roosevelt and Kedzie? No, was, I guarantee you. I know it was on Kedzie. It was on Kedzie. Like you know, I went oh, in there God. once. I was underwhelmed with what was in there. Just cheap fucking guitars and... and Dumb stereo. It's good for power tools. Hey, they got one on 47th and Ashland. That's a jackpot. Let me tell you. In case you don't understand, it's called me Jack City. In case you still don't understand, I brought.
put a long and hurt you shoot kick the ballistics come on things up here uh patrick well how is that so we're, the still house is not going down as smooth the still house moonshine is not going down as smooth as i thought i mean i maybe mean, i'm hanging over a little bit from yesterday but uh it's it'll it'll it'll, it, it'll hang out in the liquor cabinet but this is not I, mean, I don't know if we need to mix it with something it's I, yeah, uh, it's mean, rough i'm not gonna take it home i'm gonna leave it here yeah, thanks it's good I, I think it'll get you drunk what's the alcohol content on no that? it's like jack daniels it is uh 80 proof let me see it for a minute. Take some more. Take some more. Oh, I got. I still got my whole cup of this stuff. Let's see. <laughs> still House is crafted using our proprietary all natural re- I, all natural all natural recipe and estate grown corn. It's distilled in a traditional copper whiskey still and charcoal filtered for superior quality and uh, taste, allowing the natural sweetness of the corn to shine through. A remarkably mellow flavor and smooth finish makes this a truly versatile spirit. Yeah, I don't think so. Spirit is interesting. Like. Mineral spirits, I think, is what it's closer to. Um, so, Pat, what do you got going on this week? What do you want to tell everybody about? Going on? Um, so, when this show drops, hopefully on Monday. The day t- after the Southside Irish Parade. Yeah, that Tuesday I'm going to the Music Box Theater because the Music Box is doing, their, uh, doing an event with the writer of Sharknado and the uh, Chicago Field Museum where I guess he's going to come out and talk about Sharknados, and then someone from the Field Museum is going to talk about <laughs> real sharks. I don't know what the, I don't know what fucking angle they're taking. Sounds like infotainment. But yeah, I'm supposed to be doing an interview with the guy that will air on Drinks on Monday that week. So um, that'll be cool. And then uh, hopefully by within the week that this airs, the telenovela turned independent film. Yes. We'll be uh, we'll be airing on YouTube and fucking. Who'd they end up getting to edit that? Fucking me. Oh, I knew it. I had Calvin sync the sound, and then I'm just gonna. Oh, do, okay. I'll do the cutting. Anthony did the titles, and then we got the score. So I, it'll be a shit show. But you know what? Fuck it. I felt a little bad, but when he it was when he I, he got me on a bad day. He yeah. goes, uh, "Any idea when the first cut of this?" Gonna be? I, First, first cut. No, there's one. <laughs> That's what I told him too. I'm like, no, no. And I was just like, you know what? I with, with the 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 two show, the two Romero shows coming up and everything. I just I said I don't have the time to do this. Yeah. And I don't want it to just sit here. No, that's what I told him. I was like, I'll like, I'll fucking do it. So yeah. Um. Once the sound is supposed to be synced this week, and then I'll start working on it. And that's it. So yeah, Sharknado. Uh, if you got nothing going on Tuesday night, the 14th. Go see Sharknado at the Music Box. I'll be there, and uh, that, and then the seven. Panel Sullivan will be there, but also the director of Sharknado. Thunder Eleven, which yeah, I'm gonna pick his brain. Be like, yeah, because you know the other thing interesting too is that before he did Sharknado, he did Mutant Zombies from the Hood, starring C. Thomas Howell. He wrote and directed that one, and that was like my go-to fuck movie on Netflix before <laughs> Netflix and Chill became popular. That was the movie that I would invite people over, and we would smoke weed and then watch that movie. So I've seen the first 20 minutes of that movie probably like fucking 30 <laughs> times. I, I fucked more times to Mutant Zombies from the Hood than a Barry White album. Seriously. So uh, I'm looking forward to sitting down with that dude. I, on the other hand, have fucked zero times to Mutant Zombies. Then you ain't fucked, darling. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. What are you doing this week? Who are you fucking this week? Uh, you know, I'm, fuck- <laughs> I'm fucking up this money. Me and Ben. Who's Ben? Ben Franklin. <laughs> You know who. <laughs> you know who. You can catch me all week long. Catch me outside. Catch her outside. Checking them bags on my three uh, open to closes while Mike's lounging somewhere for the weekend. I'm going to Milwaukee to see Cheap Trick. When? Cheap Friday. Trick. This weekend? Yeah, this Friday I'm going to see them in Milwaukee after an Admirals game. And then uh, Waukegan going to see them at the Gen C Theater the next night. Trickcation. Hashtag Trickcation. Oh, you and Dan will have fun with that. Shout out to them. No, what? You and Dan will have fun with that. Me and Dan ain't going. I know. Oh. That's where you say. I'm going with Katie? Okay. 
Did I miss something? No, that was that was, that was the ploy. I'm real. Is, I'm real confused. And he ain't going with me. <laughs> you don't want to go see Cheap Trick. I mean, I might, but I, we ain't going so anywhere together. We can't go together. Who's going to work the bar? Who's going to be the cheap trick? <laughs> I don't know. It's bad. I don't even. I can't even think of a better response. I'm going there, and then um, <laughs> check out. You can check out. I'm co-host. I got wrapped up into another podcast, co-host of the Daily Grind House podcast, which I'm doing with during do, using Skype. So I know how to do that now, and that's an easy one. I do that every other Thursday. It's an, nobody wants to do any more than an hour, and it will, well, each week we're going to do an arbitrary film genre. And talk about what we had just seen. I think uh, we got the snake exploitation episode up now. Uh, we're doing ape exploitation, ape yeah, exploitation from the set out. from the seventies. We're gonna because okay. there's so much ape exploitation. We said we can get well, some yeah, more you mileage. Got, you got the comedy, and then you got the dystopian future. Yeah, and then um, uh, we got a new revenge of the pod people that'll be coming out. This it'll be up. It'll be up by the time this uh, show airs. Where we're doing Rocky Horror Picture Show versus Shock Treatment. And then uh, I can't wait for the first podcast after the April Fool's Day thing, <laughs> so we can talk about what a fucking shit show that's turning out to be. Oh God, I hope it. All... <laughs> <laughs> we'll see about. Yeah, we'll talk about yeah. that. So, um, thanks everybody for listening. You can subscribe to Drinks on Monday on iTunes. Interact with the Strike Team on Facebook at Drinks on Monday and Twitter at Drinks on Monday. You can look at the Strike Team on Instagram at Drinks on Monday. You can gain access to exclusive video content on YouTube by subscribing to Drinks on Monday. You can follow Mike on Twitter at Mike Vanderbilt. Pat at Pat O'Sullivan three one two. I I have I have the wrong one here. I got Pat O must die. No, it's 312. Panel 7, 312. And Dan at D. Lynch Farm D if you ever figure out how to use Twitter. Good night and have a pleasant tomorrow. Yo, everybody wants a piece of peace or a chance at least to see violence cease. Check it out. Brothers are still out to get you. Trust me. Blind as a bat. In fact, they must be. Searching for a way to escape from hell. And every minute they find itself deeper in it. They say the strong will survive the longest. Still some don't know what makes them strongest. A definite wrong guess. If you think of that money really makes you strong cause you're fat It's sad and it makes me mad, really mad as hell Cause they buy us with what they sell Give a motherfucker a car and a chance to make a movie Suddenly he's a star, it don't move me School or church can't repair the damage done 